Nate, I've got a dual screen. Do I know which screen I'm gonna be sharing? Well, I you guess I do. It'll show me when I click share screen. Correct. All right, so let's make sure I got it right here. Awesome, okay. Okay, Brian, it's 7.01. Do you think we're good to, to start, Nate? Do you think we're good to start? I think so. Okay, so is there anything else that I need to do on my part or I can just start with my introduction? You can intro, Brian. Okay, thank you. Good evening. My name is Jackie Dupler. I'm an associate attorney at the Sinus Jameis Law Firm in Lansing. I practice primarily family law, including domestic relations such as divorce and custody issues, I've been at the Sinus Dramas Law Firm for seven years. Tonight, you are here for People's Law School. People's Law School is brought to you by the Sinus Dramas Law Firm and the Michigan Association for Justice. We also have a media sponsor, WLNS6, and we are very thankful for their participation. People's Law School has been around since 1978 and has been educating Michiganders like you about the law, how it impacts you and your community. This year obviously is very exciting and different. This is our first year that we are doing People's Law School virtually. Uh, I do want to give a quick plug that next week we have a presentation on employment law. Um, it's called the Employment Survival Guide COVID-19 and Beyond and that will be presented by Marla Linderman. The format for this evening is that we'll have a presentation for about one hour then question and answer session for about 15 minutes. For the question and answers you, excuse me, for the questions, you can submit those through the chat feature through Zoom, and then we'll be able to go through those at the end of the presentation. I would ask that uh, you continue to keep yourself muted throughout the presentation, and um, I would like to now introduce our presenter for the evening. Tonight we have Brian Waldman from the Sinus Dramas Law Firm presenting. Brian attended Michigan State University for undergraduate, and Wayne State University for his law degree. He is the president of the Sinus Dravens Law Firm. His practice areas include auto accidents, bicycle accidents, pedestrian accidents, motorcycle accidents, semi-truck, personal injury, wrongful death, and dog bite claims. And tonight, Mr. Waldman will be speaking to us about distracted driving, pedestrian, and bike law. Mr. Waldman is also an adjunct professor at the MSU College of Law. He has a belief that the, his belief is that the role of, of the lawyer is to take charge of the complex legal and insurance issues that his clients are facing so his clients can put all of their focus and attention on healing and spending time with their loved ones. Brian has a very extensive resume, so I'll give you a shortened version of it. He is a cooperating attorney for the ACLU of Michigan. He regularly appears on WLNS, The Legal Edge, he was appointed by the governor in 2007 to the Michigan Civil Service Commission and later elected as the chair of the Civil Service Commission. Brian served as president of the Michigan Trial Lawyers Association, currently called Michigan Association for Justice, and he continues to serve on the organization's executive committee. Brian also sits as a council member for the State Bar of Michigan negligence section. Brian has been named in publications uh, in the publication Best Lawyers of America in the area of plaintiff's personal injury litigation every year since 2007. He was also selected as the publication's Lawyer of the Year, Plaintiff's Personal Injury in the Lansing, Michigan area for 2015, 17, and 2020. 
In his personal life, Mr. Waldman is an avid cyclist. Cyclist. Brian also diligently advocates for the rights of Michigan bicyclists. Much of his practice is dedicated to that area. And um, I, will leave, I will leave it at that so you can uh, just meet Mr. Waldman through Zoom. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's good to be here. I don't know what you're seeing right now because I have two screens and I can't figure out how to do my screen share. Do you have the PowerPoint up there, Nate? Or is it my face? Um, I see that you're sharing a file with me, um, but I can't click on it because I'm just, it's just your screen. Let's see. There's your screen saver. All right. So maybe what I need to do. You can. Open. Ah, here we go. I just need to get it on the other screen. Did that work? No, nope, I'm still, still seeing your desktop. Ah, all right. Let's see. There we go, motor vehicle. All right. All right, there we go. Sorry about the confusion. So what I'm gonna talk about tonight or what I've been asked to talk about is distracted driving, pedestrians and bicyclists. I, I frequently go around and I lecture to uh, bicycling clubs and uh, bicycle race teams. And I, I'm gonna assume that this audience is uh, probably knows less about bicycling than most of the people I talk to in those groups. I'm going to assume that most people uh, drive cars, that they're pedestrians, and, and that they want to know what the laws are around bicycles and pedestrians. And so we'll just kind of go through and review the laws that apply and then talk about how we all can benefit from distracted driving laws and, and developing those laws in the state of Michigan, what they currently are. Almost all the laws, laws I talk about today are part of what's known as the Michigan Vehicle Code, uh, often referred to as the motor, Michigan Motor Vehicle Code. Um, the formal name is the Vehicle Code, and that applies to almost anyone who uses a road for any reason. There's a lot of definitions contained in that uh, statute, and it helps to understand the definitions. A lot of people are surprised to learn that motor vehicle is defined as every vehicle that is self-propelled uh, and does not include a number of things, including motorcycles, uh, because it, it has to have at least four wheels. There's also a definition for vehicle. Vehicle includes a car. It's every device upon which any person property may be transported or drawn on the highway, um, except for devices exclusively moved by human power. So under vehicle, you've got trucks, cars, motorcycles, but you don't have bicycles, which makes Michigan somewhat unique. In most states, a uh, bicycle is considered a vehicle, but not in Michigan. Motorcycle means a vehicle that has a saddle or seat for the rider and is that designed to travel on not more than three wheels. So again, a motorcycle is a vehicle, but not a motor vehicle, which um, I'm sure in, in later sections, they'll, they'll cover the Michigan no fault law, but it means that when you drive a motorcycle, you do not purchase Michigan no fault insurance. You still need to purchase other types of insurance, but you don't need to purchase the type of insurance you purchase on an automobile or, or a truck. If you uh, live in the Lansing or East Lansing area, you see mopeds on the road. Uh, a moped is like a motorcycle, uh, but it, it maxes out before it gets to 30 miles per hour um, on, on a level surface is, is basically the distinction there. And then you have a bicycle. Uh, it's a device propelled by human or propelled by human power, uh, which a person may ride having two or three wheels in a tandem tricycle arrangement. And for it to be a bicycle, the wheels are all over 14 inches in di diameter. And then of course, pedestrians, 
we think of that as people who walk, people who run, but it's also people using what the law calls a mobility, a power driven mobility device. So it could be a wheelchair or an Amigo, um, and that's included in the definition of a mobility device or of a, of a pedestrian. Um, and if you looked at, at the definition of motor vehicle, it specifically excluded electric skateboards. This is something that a lot of states were struggling to define. Uh, Michigan was kind of ahead of the curve. And in my opinion, Michigan, the legislature tends to be behind the curve and, and doing things that are done in other states to catch up with technology most often. But here we were ahead of the curve. And the reason for that is if anybody's vacationed on Lake Michigan, uh, in, oops, what did I do? If anyone's uh, vacationed in Lake Michigan, around Lake Michigan up in Frankfurt, there was a surf shop that was renting um, paddle boards uh, down at the beach, but their shop was, was several blocks in. And the way that their employees would get the paddle boards to the beach was just like this photograph. They would, uh, you know, their employees would get on a skateboard that was powered by electricity, an electric skateboard, and they would pull these paddle boards down to the beach. And they started to, to run into problems with the local sheriff's department, saying that they were uh, violating the law, that they needed to have insurance, a number of other things. So they went to their state representative and the state representative introduced legislation, which was passed, that said an electric skateboard is a wheel device that has a floorboard designed to be stood upon. Um, it, it defined how fast it could go, 20, up to 25 miles per hour. Said it could have handlebars, but as you can see in this picture, it doesn't. Um, and so Michigan adopted this statute that excluded electric skateboards from motor vehicles, so they didn't need to, to get auto insurance or, or any type of insurance to be on the roadway, similar to a bicycle. And uh, the law took effect really kind of in a, a grassroots way to support a local business. Uh, and what was interesting about that, and I realize this is a little off of the uh, topic, but it really goes to the fact that there's all types of ways to get around in our society, not just cars, people walk, people bike, people take mopeds, people now take electric skateboards. And uh, this is a picture of me riding electric scooters that all of a sudden just started to pop every, up everywhere that you can rent. And because Michigan adopted this definition of electric skateboard, if you look at the definition, it covers these electric scooters that you can rent really in, in any decent sized city in the country, or, and, and certainly in Michigan and Detroit, Grand Rapids, East Lansing, they Lansing. Uh, so Michigan was one of the first states in the country that actually had a law that defined uh, what these scooters are, but they fall into the definition of electric skateboard, not electric scooter under, under Michigan law. Um, all right, so as we talk about these laws, whether you're a person who rides a bike or drives a car, I think most people who, who ride bikes probably do both, drive a car and ride a bike, or you walk or you run. What I really wanna emphasize is that it's easy to think about these things as just objects. But the important thing is that there's people in all these objects. There's people inside cars, there's people on bikes, there's people on motorcycles, people on scooters. And in my opinion, we all have a, a way or in our society that's kind of become an accepted part of our culture that once you get behind the wheel of a motor vehicle, somehow, you know, a lot of manners just kind of go out the window when we think of people as, as not being people, but kind of objects. It's just some other car rather than some other person. Um, and as we go through the laws, I'd just like to emphasize that, that when we all drive or ride our bikes or, or move around town, just remind ourselves that it's, it's a person, not a car, not a bike. All right. So first let's talk about bicycles because there's a lot of law on bicycles. There's less law on pedestrians. Um, the law says even though a bicycle is not a vehicle, a uh, bicycle has all the rights and all the duties of, of vehicles or motor vehicles. So that essentially means 
Bicycles are allowed to use the road. They're allowed to uh, travel on, on Michigan's roads, but they have to follow all the rules that an automobile or a motor vehicle or a motorcycle would follow, with exceptions being those provisions in the law that are very clear that it was intended for a motor vehicle. And there's also some additional rules that are specifically intended for bicycles. We're gonna go through some of those. Uh, first thing is bikes are not allowed on what the law calls limited access highways. Those are the things that, that most people think about as expressways, I-96, 496. There's not an intersection. You merge on and you merge off. Uh, bicycles, or someone riding a bicycle is not allowed on an expressway. Um, we commonly hear uh, bicycles shouldn't be in the roads. Cyclists never follow the roads. And to quote someone who showed it at me once when I was riding my bike down, up down the road, get off the road, you never stop at stop signs. Um, I, I don't, I, I do try to stop at stop signs. I don't know why that person thought I didn't. I, I don't have their name to quote them. Uh, but you know, it, that, that's the feeling of some people, um, regardless of what the law says. Um, but I think if, if you were to pay attention, and, and there have been studies where people have done it, um, most people who drive cars don't always follow the laws. People speed, they've done studies at stop signs in terms of, of the percentage of people that stop at stop signs. Um, I, I did not find any of those studies, but I found a quote from a guy named Jack that said, I sat at the car uh, waiting for my wife to come out of the store trying to see if anybody came to a complete stop at a stop sign. 52 cars came by, five came to a complete stop, and four of them, it was to avoid hitting another car. So only one person really stopped, truly just because they had a stop sign. And, um, you know, I, I think probably most bicyclists that I see on the road roll through stop signs. Most cars that I see the, on the road roll through stop signs and, and we've all got an obligation to follow the rules. Um, oh, all right, this is a PowerPoint slide that I never went and finished, but I've read studies that show that when there's a bicycle car crash, uh, anywhere in that, again, different studies, some show that about 50% of the time it's the car's fault, 50% of the time it's the bike's fault. I've read other studies that show 70% of the time it's the car's fault, 30% of the time it's, it's the bike's fault, but it's usually in about that range. Um, most of that data is collected uh, from police reports. And in, in Michigan, the state police are a clearinghouse for police reports from different police agencies. Um, a good source of uh, information to correct kind of what the law is and isn't as it applies to cars, pedestrian and bikes, I just want to point out is uh, the Michigan State Police has on its website something called Everybody's Rule, Everybody's Road, Everybody's Rules. And it's, a, um, it's available at michigan.gov slash walk safe. And they've got little quizzes and videos. Um, People may look at bicycles, uh, you know, one of the common complaints is they see a cyclist like in this picture and they say, whoa, you know, the law says that bicycles are supposed to be as far to the right as practicable is what the law says when they're in the roadway. And this person's obviously not on the right edge of the roadway. They're kind of more toward the yellow line or at least in the middle. Uh, and if you're in a car, you might not see the reason they're doing that is because of all the potholes on the right edge of the roadway. And in Michigan, we certainly have plenty of potholes. And so the law says that, they have, that a cyclist has to be as far to the right edge as is practicable, uh, but that there are exceptions. And those exceptions are when they're overpassing, uh, when they're taking or overpassing, an, a car or a bicycle, and that would apply it for a pedestrian too, preparing to make a left-hand turn, or when the conditions of the road, uh, the right-hand edge of the road, make it unsafe or unreasonable for a bicycle to use the right side of the road. 
like surface hazards, potholes, cracks, drain openings, dead animals. Um, or if the lane is narrow enough to begin with, that if a car was trying to pass a bicycle, it couldn't do so safely in that lane, even if the bicycle was on the right edge of the roadway. Cyclists are allowed to ride two abreast um, or, or side by side. Uh, Michigan law specifically states that um, they're allowed to do that and they want to do it so that they can, you know, talk and be social. But it also, you know, if you've seen a group of cyclists like this and they're two by two, uh, it makes the length of the cycling group half the distance to pass that it would be if they were all lined up one by one. So it actually allows cars to get by them quicker. The other thing it does when they ride two by two, which by the way, it also does when a cyclist gets out further from the edge, is it makes them more visible to motorists. And, and really that's probably the most important thing is that, that motorists be able to recognize people on bicycles. Cyclists can use the sidewalks in Michigan. Um, they have the right to use the sidewalk uh, under state law, but many municipal, city, township laws prevent the use of bicycles on sidewalks in certain areas, usually in business districts. And it's tough for, for anyone uh, to know what sidewalks they can and cannot ride their bicycle on. For example, in, in East Lansing, last time I checked, the local ordinance said that you can ride your bicycle on the sidewalk in the city of East Lansing, unless you're on Grand River between Abbott and Collingwood, I believe it is. Um, and, you know, it's, it, you still see bicycles in that area. It's hard to know who would think that that's the only portion that you're not allowed to ride a bicycle on the sidewalk. And uh, in fact, some of the people I've seen riding bicycles on the sidewalk on that area are East Lansing police who are, are patrolling on bicycle. Um, Sorry, I'm having a technology issue here. Uh, obviously, the other issue on, on the sidewalk is bicycles have to yield the pedestrians. They have to let them know when they're coming. Um, and they obviously don't want to uh, create a danger or inconvenience for cyclists. The other reason cyclists don't like being on the sidewalk is cars typically don't stop where they should. Uh, and I drive a car. The way our roads are designed makes it difficult and in most instances or many instances to stop where you're supposed to. So this is called the limit line right here. This is called the crosswalk. And a lot of people stop where they block the crosswalk, particularly coming out of driveways. And the reason is the way many of our roads are designed, it's just difficult to see whether it's safe to pull out unless you pull out across the sidewalk. So. A lot of people who ride bicycles complain it's not safe for them to be on the sidewalk because cars are not looking for them riding on the sidewalk. They're looking for, for cars riding in the street. They have a better chance of seeing a bicycle if the bicycle is also riding in the street. Uh, bicycles uh, are allowed to ride at night or in the dark, but a half an hour after, I'm sorry, how does it work? A half an hour before sunrise and a half an hour after sunset, I know that's counterintuitive, but a half an hour after sunset, bikes have to be equipped with a white light in the front and not a red light in the back, but just a red reflector. Uh, but in addition to that, they can add a red light. I would obviously recommend that they do add a bright flashing red light. Um, whether you're a bicyclist or a pedestrian, uh, there's a term that we use. It's really not a legal term, it's a scientific term, but, but it comes up in a lot of our cases, and it's called conspicuity. 
And it just means being conspicuous, trying to make yourself visible. Um, and what actually helps a lot is uh, reflectors on pedals, because if you have a reflective device or a, a bright color and it's moving, that is most likely to be seen. A lot of really kind of elite cyclists will take off the pedals with the reflectors so they can use what's called clip-in pedals. And the cyclists I know who do that and are smart when they're commuting or riding in the dark, they put reflective tape or reflective paint on their shoes uh, or other parts of, of their bike, bicycle and their body that may be moving or not moving. Uh, cyclists are required to use hand signals um, to uh, signal that they're turning left. They have to hold their left arm out. The traditional way of signaling to turn right is to turn your left hand out and up. Uh, but the law says that you can also now just hold your right arm out to the right. And then to signal to stop, a cyclist is supposed to hold their left hand in the downward position. Um, surprise to a lot of people, helmets are not required to ride a bicycle in Michigan. Um, there's one small exception to that, and, and that's when a, a child under a certain age is, is riding an e-bicycle that goes above a certain speed. Um, but we don't, we don't require helmets on motorcycles and we don't require helmets on bicycles in Michigan. Um, so there's no law against not wearing a helmet. There's also no law against uh, drinking alcohol and getting on a bicycle. And while obvious, in my opinion, you're better off getting on a bicycle if you're drinking alcohol than getting in a car, you're probably better off uh, not doing either if you're under the influence of alcohol. Um, cell phones, there's no law preventing the use of cell phones um, on bicycles, but there is a law that says you have to keep both your hands on the handlebars and keep the, 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 the bike under control. And so you're not allowed, what it specifically says is you're not allowed to take your hands off the handlebars and carry a package. And so if that cell phone is considered a package, and I don't know that it would be, but I can see where a police officer or a judge might, might conclude that it is for purposes of the statute, that would be a violation of the Motor Vehicle Code. Um, and any violation of the Motor Vehicle Code is a civil infraction. Um, oh, one of the, the items that is really growing in popularity is uh, electric bicycles or something called e-bikes. Um, they're bikes that, that you typically pedal and there's an electric motor that assists to make it go faster, although some of them uh, work without pedaling. They're divided into three classes, type one, type two, and type three. And, and based on the, the category that it falls into, that defines where and how it can be used or mostly where it can be used. So the first one is a class one electric bicycle. So the class one electric bicycle is one that you can pedal or that you have to pedal for the engine to engage. If you stop pedaling, the engine shuts off. And the engine also shuts off once the bicycle gets up to 20 miles per hour. So bicycles can be ridden on linear trails, which is like a rail trail or the Lansing River Trail. This is actually a picture of the Lansing River Trail. And so they are allowed to be used on those trails unless the local entity that is, is responsible for that trail, say the city of Lansing with the Lansing River Trail, says we're not gonna allow class one e-bikes. There's a presumption that they're allowed, but the local government then has the authority to, to to disallow it. Class two and class three electric bicycles are presumed to be not allowed on these linear trails, which again can be paved, limestone, rail trail. This is again a shot of the river trail. And so a class two or class three, so class two is it an e-bike that cannot go faster than 20 miles per hour but that you can operate where the motor will engage without pedaling. A class three e-bike 
is a, an electric bicycle that you have to pedal to engage the electric motor. And if you stop pedaling, the motor shuts off. The other way the motor shuts off is if you get to 28 miles per hour. And so unless the local entity specifically says we're going to allow a class two or class three bicycle on our linear trail, the presumption is it's not allowed. The other thing is uh, if you're on a uh, mountain bike trail or what's called non-motorized trails, you are not allowed to ride any type of e-bike uh, unless the entity that's in charge of the mountain bike trail specifically says we're going to allow e-bikes or, or we're going to allow e-bikes with certain limitations on our mountain bike or non-motorized trails or multi-use trails. This is actually a picture of uh, this past weekend, my wife mountain biking at the DT Energy Trail. It's a beautiful place um, in Chelsea, I believe. You get off at the Stockbridge exit, you can walk out there, hike out there, run, and then they have uh, maintained mountain bike trails and it's really a, a great, great resource for us in Michigan, particularly in this area. Don't know what that is. Um, what about protecting cyclists? The, the law in Michigan uh, says that, that you have to allow three feet between the car's mirror and the cyclist's outer edge when passing a bicycle. That's a statewide law. Michigan was one of the very last states in the country to have a safe passing law for cars passing bicycles. I think there's a few left, but I think when Michigan's law passed, if I'm right, there was only four or five states that had not already passed some form of a safe passing law. Uh, and most of those, uh, most of the states have laws that say that there has to be a distance of three feet when you pass. Some states uh, have, have greater distances. Some states have a distance that varies based on the speed of the car. The faster you go, the greater the distance has to be. Um, Michigan adopted uh, a three foot passing law. Uh, and the controversial part for most cyclists is that it's, the car has to be three feet for the, to the left of the bicycle, or if it's impracticable to pass the bicycle at a distance of three feet to the left, at a safe distance to the left of that bicycle at a safe speed. Um, and then once you pass as a motorist, you have to get back over. Same rule applies in terms of how you pass getting back over, whether it's a, a motor vehicle that you're passing or a car that you're passing. You have to get back over as soon as you can safely do so. Um, there's a separate statute that is almost identical to, to this that says you have to pass three feet to the right on those roads where a bicycle is allowed to be on the left-hand edge of the roadway, like a one-way street. And the law also says that even if you're in a non-passing zone as a motorist, you can cross the center line if it's safe to do so to make sure that there's a safe distance between you and the bicycle. So you can see you know, this, this red pickup truck is safely passing, but it's doing so by crossing over a double yellow line, where it, which it normally would not be able to do, so that it can make sure that it gives a safe passing distance to the person on the bicycle. Um, three feet looks a whole lot different when you're on the bicycle than when you're in the car. Um, if you look at this photograph right here, it, it says it's three feet and it looks like a lot of distance, but this is actually less than three feet because in Michigan, instead of that first foot starting at the edge of the, the car, it starts at the edge of the uh, side mirror. And so three feet's actually greater than this. Uh, this is a photograph from another state uh, where they were trying to demonstrate what three feet looked like when they passed a new law. Um, I said Michigan was one of the last states to adopt a safe passing law. Um, a number of cities, townships, were becoming frustrated that they, they had very, very high numbers of bicycle motor vehicle collisions and the state legislature wasn't really taking any action. Um, in particular, uh, Grand Rapids had one of the highest 
bicycle motor vehicle collision rates in the country, and they kind of led the charge. And so they adopted a city ordinance, as did a number of other cities, before the state adopted a safe passing law. They adopted their own safe passing law in their city, and they made it five feet. And so uh, in a number of cities, the local law says that motorists have to pass a bicycle not at three feet, but at five feet. And I've, I've listed the ones that I'm aware of here. There may be others, Grand Rapids, Kalamazoo, Ann Arbor, Norton Shores, Oshimo Township. I think Dearborn was the most recent one, Kalamazoo Township, Muskegon and Portage. Um, most, one of the, within the last, ooh, I want to say about a year and a half, we also have a new law that went into effect about driver's education that applies to bicycles. It actually applies to everyone that, that lawmakers call vulnerable roadway users. And, and what it says is that if there is a, a if driver's education class being given, at least one hour of information has to be given concerning laws pertaining to bicycles, motorcycles, and other vulnerable roadway users including pedestrians, and shall emphasize, aware, emphasize awareness of their operation on the streets, roads, and highway of the state. Uh, it's actually a law that was originally enacted in a different form and called Nathan's Law, after uh, a young man in the thumb named Nathan died in a motorcycle versus uh, automobile collision. All right, let's talk about pedestrian law a little bit. Um, pedestrians, again, are not just people walking. They're people running. They're people in wheelchairs. And they're all vulnerable roadway users. The law in Michigan, in, in my opinion, is a little sparse with regard to pedestrians and a little confusing. And we commonly hear pedestrians have the right of way. Pedestrians have the right of way. And we all kind of think that that's the law when you drive a motor vehicle. And it's probably a good kind of common sense law, but it's not always the statutory law or the letter of the law in Michigan. Um, so the first question is, can pedestrians, uh, walkers, joggers, wheelchairs be in the road? Or do they need to be on the sidewalk? And the answer is, if a sidewalk is present, or if there's a sidewalk in the area, the person has to be on the sidewalk. They can't be on the road. And a lot of runners um, will, will get in the road because they think asphalt is better on their knees and ankles and joints than cement. Um, but the reality is that, that if there's a sidewalk, a pedestrian has to be on that sidewalk and not in the roadway. So this person following the law, this person criminal, this person criminal, or lawbreaker, not really criminals. If there's not a sidewalk, where's the pedestrian supposed to be? If there's not a sidewalk, the pedestrian shall, when it's practicable, walk on the left side of the highway facing traffic. And I should have mentioned this, bicycles um, are always supposed to be on the right side of the, the roadway going in the same direction is motor vehicle traffic. Pedestrians, just the opposite, left side of the roadway, facing traffic. But it's, it's not that they have to, they have to do it when it's practicable. So what does that mean? Practicable means able to be done or put into practice successfully. So um, for example, if you had a situation like this, well, there's actually a sidewalk here, so the person should be on the sidewalk. But if we either assume there was not a sidewalk and a pedestrian was walking on the left side of the road on a blind curve, that might be a dangerous situation for the pedestrian to put himself or herself in. And so maybe they should be on the other side of the road for just that portion. Or if they were coming over the crest of a hill and the car would, would have no view of them until it got over the hill and the pedestrian wouldn't have a, a view until it got over the hill. Maybe when they're going up the hill, they should get on the other side of the road. So it's not a always on the left side, but, but generally on the left side of the roadway. Um, and then of course, no one should ever be in the middle of the roadway. Uh, this little girl is clearly 
a rule breaker and, uh, and should be cited, right? All right, pedestrians like bicycles are not allowed on expressways. Um, pedestrian traffic signs. So if a pedestrian is at a crosswalk and there is a light intended for pedestrians, obviously the walk sign means you've got the right of way as a pedestrian. You can go ahead and, and walk. If it is a solid red pedestrian signal or a flashing red and in the countdown mode, that's considered um, a don't walk that the law calls either steady burning or flashing. And a pedestrian shall not start to cross the roadway in the direction of the signal. But if you've already started, you can complete going across. And I guess the, the, the importance of that is if you don't make it all the way across, the cars that are waiting for, whose light has just turned green don't have the right to say, hey, you didn't make it far enough across, we're just going. You've got the right to finish. And if you're a motorist, you know, hopefully you're a decent enough person that you let the person finish walking across the street. If there's no pedestrian light signals at the intersection, but there are motor vehicle or vehicle signals, a pedestrian um, facing uh, a green light like a, like a car has, has the right to go ahead and cross the street. If they're facing a red light, they obviously don't have the right to walk into the street. And if they're facing a yellow light, what the law actually says, if they're, they are advised that there is insufficient time. I, I would say that they should be strongly advised that there is insufficient time for them to safely cross the street. They probably shouldn't do it. Um, what if you're a car? What are your obligations to the pedestrian if you're driving a car? Well, if you're facing a red signal, you obviously need to stop and yield the right of way to pedestrians cross, who are in the crosswalk. And that includes if you want to stop and make a right-hand turn. And you have to yield the right of way to pedestrians uh, both on the street that, that you're facing and the one that you're turning onto. Um, if you're at a green signal, uh, you've got the right to go, uh, but you still need to yield the right of way to other vehicles and to pedestrians lawfully within the intersection or an adjacent crosswalk. And if there's a yellow signal, uh, vehicular traffic shall stop before entering the nearest crosswalk at the intersection. And if the stop can't be made uh, safely, and I can cautiously pass through the intersection and, and hopefully uh, I would think safely, clearly that means that there can't be a pedestrian in the crosswalk or in your way. If you've got a green uh, turn signal, either left or right, obviously you can go, but you still need to yield the right of way to pedestrians on uh, intersecting streets. Uh, and then a little more, uh, confusing is what happens if you've got a crosswalk, not at an intersection, but just right in the middle of the block. You see that a lot on MSU's campus. And so what's the law then? The Motor Vehicle Code has no law for that. But something called the Uniform Traffic Code does. The Michigan Uniform Traffic Code is something that is adopted often by cities or townships, by most of them, but not all. And so the laws under the Uniform Traffic Code apply on most roads, but not all roads in Michigan. And it essentially says that the driver of a vehicle shall yield the right of way by slowing down or stopping if necessary so as to yield to a pedestrian crossing the roadway within a crosswalk when the pedestrian is on the same half of the roadway as the vehicle. And then there's lots of cities that have ordinances that create a, a greater burden for motorists uh, yielding to pedestrians. Ann Arbor is the city that, that really comes to mind. Um, they've, they've kind of struggled and tweaked their 
uh, crossing ordinance over the years. Um, but essentially, if in, in Ann Arbor, for example, if a pedestrian has started to walk across the street at all, you need to stop and yield for them or slow down and yield for them. And Traverse City, by the way, has really, really taken great efforts to, to make their downtown area and their entire city safer to pedestrians. Um, all right, let's talk about distracted driving. What is distracted driving? Distracted driving is, is driving while doing another activity that takes your attention away from driving and increases the chances of a motor vehicle crash, right? Distracted driving, this is the definition by the Center for Disease Control, United States Center for Disease Control. And in, the CDC does this because obviously it's a risk to the health and well-being and the lives of Americans. So the CDC cares about distracted driving. It is not something that is new. Distracted driving uh, can mean a number of things. It can mean dry, drinking coffee, applying makeup, searching for a radio station. Um, this person has a car that's old enough where maybe they were playing their CD or even their, uh, their cassette tape all distractions that, that go back many, many years. But of course, in today's world, the distractions are more than ever, and it's largely because of cell phones and mobile devices. And so texting and other ways that people use mobile devices are, are you know, I, anyone who drives, I don't need to say it. I mean, you see it everywhere you go. People are, are looking at their phones instead of looking at the road. And it, um, it's scary, it's aggravating, and it's uh, significant. According to the um, National Highway Traffic Safety Association, in 2018, there were 2,841 fatalities. 8% of the fatal crashes in this country uh, were from distracted driving, and 15% of crashes that resulted in injuries most of the time, it was a motor vehicle versus motor vehicle crash, 1,730, or it was the drivers of those vehicles and the passengers, 605. But 400 of the, the, the people were pedestrians of the fatalities, and 77 were bicyclists. Now, I would say that those are probably grossly uh, undervalued or, or deflated numbers. And the reason I say that is when someone studies like the uh, NHTSA studies or, any, or the CDC studies, how many of their cra the crashes were from distracted driving, what they're doing is they're looking at what they call traffic crash reports from various police agencies. And in the cases we handle, we actually get to see facts and get into them in much more detail. I mean, if you think about everything police officers have to do, you know, they get a call, there's an accident, they figure out who's at fault, they clean up the scene, they write a citation, and they move on to the domestic violence call or the breaking and entering or whatever it is that they've got to get to next. And so they don't have the ability necessarily to follow up and do all the things that we would do in our cases that sometimes go, go on for years. And so we, we see the difference between reality and traffic crash reports. And I'm gonna give you a, one example here of why I believe that distracted driving contributing to crashes is underreported. Here's a traffic crash report prepared by the Southgate Police Department in one of my cases. And you can see the date of the crash. The time of the crash is 2026, which that means 8.26 p.m., military time, right? And there was a crash here. This was the person that hit my client who was on a bicycle, and he was cited for a failure to yield. But the police officer said that he was not distracted. And if you just talk to, the, to my client and uh, the person who was driving the car and hit him, you know, you would, you would conclude that neither was, that, that, that the driver of the car was not distracted. He told the police he wasn't distracted. He said that my client just came out of nowhere. My client said the defendant came out of nowhere and basically turned into a, a Sam's Club parking lot. When he did, my client was riding his bicycle on the sidewalk. And um, 
and the car and was crossing the Sam's Club driveway and the car just ran him over. Um, well, remember this, 8.26 p.m. was the time of the crash. When we subpoenaed the phone records at 8.25 p.m., he got an incoming phone call. And so um, it was, and then, you know, through other sources, we were able to pretty clearly demonstrate that he was on this one minute phone call that came in at 825, ended one minute later at 826 at the time of the, the boom, the crash. Now the police never reported that. And, and it's pretty common we see stuff like that. We try to subpoena phone records, text records, and, and you know, in real significant cases, we'll even try to download the data from a person's phone and distracted driving, I just feel based on, on my own experience investigating these cases is really underreported. I don't blame the police. Um, you know, they can't make a, a kind of federal case and a huge investigation out of every, every accident scene they go to. Um, but I do believe it's underreported. Um, so how does Michigan prevent distracted driving? As part of our motor vehicle code, we have a law that says a person shall not read, manually type, or send a text message on a wireless two-way communication device, a cell phone. All right, so that's it. So what you can't do in Michigan is while you're driving, you can't read a text and you can't send a text, right? But if you read that statute, there's nothing that stops you from looking at Facebook while you're driving. There's nothing that stops you from sending messages through Facebook or looking at Instagram or even watching videos on YouTube, reading emails, looking at your calendar. None of that's prevented under our current law. And, and frankly, compared to other states, our law on distracted driving is, is embarrassingly weak. Um, there have been calls to strengthen it. And I want to talk about those calls a little bit. And hopefully, if enough people are concerned and they talk to their state representative, state senator, we'll get some, get some progress. Because whether you're a motorist or a driver, um, you know, driver of car, motorcycles, bicycles, walkers, if you have kids, we're, we're all better off if people are not distracted while they're driving. Um, and I should point out that if you look at Michigan statute, it's actually not even legal to text if your phone is mounted on the uh, dashboard or if you rest it on your lap. It's not against the law to text or read a text. It's only if it's in your hand. The penalty under the current law says that if you are caught texting and driving, it's $100 fine the first time, $200 fine the second time, and the big things with most uh, moving violations in Michigan is you get points on your record with the Secretary of State, your insurance rates go up, and if you get enough points, your license is eventually you know, suspended. Um, we really, I, you know, I think as a society in Michigan, show how little we care about distracted driving when we have no points for a violation uh, of texting and driving. Um, Governor Whitmer at her first state of the state um, indicated that she wanted to make ending distracting driving one of her legislative priorities. Um, and uh, there have been some efforts from both parties to get that done. And then there have been some efforts to stop it from, from getting done. And so far the people who are trying to stop it are winning. Uh, the first bill that was introduced uh, was by Representative Manugian. House Bill 4148, and what it said is that you can only use a cell phone in a hands-free mode, but you can touch your, your cell phone or your mobile device to read, select, enter a telephone number, or answer a call only for the purpose of making and receiving a call. So it created a little exception that probably is still a distraction, but a big improvement and I think try to be realistic that people are going to be calling each other. It said, if there's a violation, first time we're gonna keep it at $100, um, or the judge can order 16 hours of community service, or both, 
The second violation, still $200, but the judge also has the opportunity of making it a sentence of, or a punishment of 24 hours of community service or both. And that the fines were doubled for so typo violations resulting in, in crashes. Uh, Representative Manugian's uh, bill, as she wrote it and introduced it, also said that for the uh, second offense, not the first offense, but the second offense, there'll be a point on the driving record with the Secretary of State, and then the third offense, there'd be two points. Uh, Representative Manugian's bill was introduced in the House. It passed a uh, subcommittee vote, I believe, and then it never went anywhere with the full uh, house. And I can't remember what subcommittee passed it. Then there was a separate uh, distracted driving bill, which was uh, Representative Tristan Cole and Representative Shepard. They got together and, and introduced two bills, House Bill 4198 and 4199, which was, in my opinion, well, I don't know that it's opinion, I think it's a fact, it's much weaker than the Manugian bill. All it did was expand the definition of a distracted driving to include more things than just texting. It said that you can't send emails or read emails. It said you can't communicate with Facebook Messenger. And, and the problem, in my opinion, with it is it tried to get specific in saying the things you cannot do, which means that every time there's some new technology to communicate through a different app, it's not going to be included under the statute if we were to adopt the Cole Shepherd bill. And even as written, it still would allow many things to happen on, on a cell phone or mobile device, such as watching YouTube videos. Um, Cole Shepard bill really hasn't gone anywhere in the Michigan House either. Um, Ruth Johnson, former Secretary of State, in my opinion, has introduced the best bill. I think she did. She actually probably did it before Manugian. Uh, Ruth Johnson introduced Senate Bill 288. Um, and, and essentially, and I was trying to remember what this was and I was scrambling for time, but as I recall, uh, Senator Johnson's bill said that drivers can't hold or use a cell phone unless it's in a hands-free mode. It's just that simple. If you're gonna use your phone, you've gotta do it in some type of hands-free method. Um, and then I just cannot re recall how, the, how uh, Senator Johnson modified the penalties for the violation of that statute. Um, so I was told to talk for about an hour. We're at the 57 minute mark if I'm doing this right. So I'm gonna end my screen share. And so you should, do you have a picture of me now on your screen or do you still have my screen itself? We see your face, Brian. Excellent, okay. So, uh, I'll try and answer some questions. Do I go to Q&A or do I go to chat? There are some questions in both sections, okay. so whichever one you wanna do first. What is a safe distance for car to pedestrian on roads with no shoulder? Very scary for pedestrians. Uh, I agree. Um, so, you know, what is a safe distance? And, you know, I'm assuming that you're writing this, you're, you're doing it because you, you're a walker or a runner. And, uh, you know, this isn't a legal opinion. This is an opinion of someone who walks, runs, uses the streets. There, there actually aren't a whole lot of sidewalks in my neighborhood and I walk a lot with my wife. Um, the speed of the car <laughs> can determine, in my opinion, what's a safe distance, um, you know, but you can actually go to MDOT's website and they've got videos of the right way to do it. And the right way to do it is just to slow down and, and move as far away from the pedestrian, bicycle, walker, jogger as you can. And if a car is coming the other direction, if you just wait for that other car to pass, the likelihood is you're gonna get where you need to go and it'll slow you down somewhere between three to seven seconds. And so, you know, is it worth three seconds of your time, five seconds of your time to make sure that you don't, you know, scare a pedestrian or, or even worse, you know, hurt a pedestrian or kill a pedestrian? 
Um, the next question is Canada outlawed use of phones while driving amazingly more safe while on the road. Yeah, shocking. Um, what efforts exist in Michigan to have similar laws? Is there legislative support that leads that effort? Um, so I, I, you know, obviously no surprise that when people aren't using phones, things are safer. Um, I talked about the efforts in Michigan and the bills that were introduced. I, I, what I didn't mention, because you, you say, is there, is, is there legislation to support um, or a legislature to support? Um, there are people who support it. There's a, there's a large number who support it. I've actually lobbied on this issue or met with uh, some senators, but mostly state representatives on this issue. And uh, most are in support of it. The problem is the people who are in power of, of letting things come to vote in front of committees or a full vote in front of a chamber of our legislature are, aren't making it a priority. Um, the very, very frustrating thing to me is um, occasionally you'll get a, a, a state representative when you meet and talk to them about these bills that say, yeah, I agree there's too much distracted driving but I like talking to my constituents and I do a lot of driving back and forth and I don't wanna to have to put them on speakerphone. It sounds like I'm in a tunnel. Or I like talking to my wife, some of them will even say, and I don't like talking, my wife doesn't like hearing me on speakerphone. And so that's a little frustrating. The real frustrating thing are the, the uh, state representatives that I've met with who say, I think the, the Manoogian bill is a great bill or I think Ruth Johnson bill is a great bill but the governor made it one of her legislative priorities at the state of the state. And I'm with the other party. And so I'm not going to do anything to help her with one of her legislative priorities. So even though I think it's a good idea, I'm not going to vote for it. And I'm going to try and make sure that it doesn't get a vote. And to me, um, when the politics kind of trumps common sense, it, it, that's when it gets frustrating. And I typically have to leave those meetings. Um, so there is support. Uh, if, if you live in this area, my guess is that your state representative and your state senator supports this. Um, I think most of them do. It would be nice for all of them to hear that people think it's a good idea because I, I think there's an overwhelming majority of, of people in the legislature who think this is a good idea. They just need to know that their constituents care about it and that they're following what they do. Um, so, uh, here's a, a question. Can I drive my bike drunk? I think I answered that. The answer is you can drive your bike drunk. Should you drive your bike drunk? No. Can you drive your bike? Uh, it's not illegal. I guess it depends how drunk you are, whether you can actually drive it or not. Um, but it's, it's never a good idea to do it under the influence. Um, you're better off calling an Uber, calling a friend. Um, the next question, boy, I'm having trouble reading it. There are Amish vehicles using the road. Avid horseback rider articles, the roads either to get for trailhead. I'm sorry, I can't, whoever's asking the question about Amish vehicles and horses. I just, I can't make out the question. I, there's, I must not understand it or there's typos uh, or abbreviations I can't make out. Um, and then uh, there's a question, would doing social media while driving be considered reckless endangerment? Um, as far as I know, there is no, and I could be wrong about this, there is no reckless endangerment uh, crime in Michigan. There are similar crimes with similar words, um, like reckless conduct causing an injury, you know, reckless use of a motor vehicle, negligent use of a motor vehicle causing an injury, negligent use of a motor vehicle causing death. Um, and so all the laws that are still on the books still apply, 
but the, the law that's specific to, to texting or using a phone is the law that I gave you. So if you're using a phone and you run a red light because you're looking at the phone instead of the red light, well, you violated the rule that says um, that you can't run a red light or that you have to stop at a stop sign. Um, or if you end up not seeing a pedestrian or getting in a crash with another car and killing someone, you can be charged with negligent operation of a motor vehicle resulting in death, uh, which is a separate crime, but you can't be charged with the, the specific crime of texting and driving unless you, you, you specifically are texting, which in Michigan would not include social media. Hope that makes sense. It's a good question, Mike. Um, how is business district defined? Um, that's a really good question. Um, and, you know, there's no specific answer to it. And, and typically, and the reason I'm assuming that this, this question is being asked is typically, if you look at, say, laws prohibiting bicycles on sidewalks, a lot of cities will prevent it in what they call the business district. And the reason there's no set definition on what best business district is, is typically that is defined by local ordinance. So, you know, I, I mentioned that, that where you're not allowed to use a bicycle on the sidewalk in East Lansing the last time I read it, a lot of times cities will say, you know, and I think Lansing has an ordinance like this, you can't use a bicycle on the sidewalk in the business district. And then you have to go further into the Lansing city ordinance to see how they define business district. And it'll be, you know, on the westbound edge, you know, Martin Luther King or Capitol Avenue and on the northmost edge, Saginaw or however, however they do it. But, but usually it's the way you find the definition of business district is just to look at the city ordinances under the definitions and there'll be a definition of business, business district. Um, Someone mentioned that they had a bicycle called a recumbent, which is when you, you kind of lay back and your, your feet are up, um, that had wheels on the front that were smaller than 14 inches in diameter. Yeah, I, I mean, Michigan's definition of a bicycle requiring all the wheels to be more than 14 inches seems a little strange to me. I, I have actually stopped and measured some of the front wheels on some bicycles to see if they were 14 inches. They all were. Um, you know, in my opinion, you probably are still going to be treated like a bicycle, uh, but Michigan's definition is probably a little outdated, as are, you know, a lot of laws across the state, especially city ordinances. Um, for example, in the city of Leslie, there's an ordinance that says anyone who rides a bicycle through the city has to stop and have it registered by the chief of police. Um, and you can just imagine how the chief of police of Leslie would feel if everyone on the bicycle came to the uh, police station and said, I need to see the police chief to register my bike because I'm riding through the city right now. Um, so maybe it's time to update some of these laws. Um, unless there are any questions that I'm missing, I'm not seeing anything else. So I'm gonna turn it back over to Jackie. I appreciate you, you joining me. All right. Well, I just want to thank you again, Brian, for your time and all of the information that you shared. Um, thank you again to MAJ and WLNS for their assistance. And to all of our participants, thank you again for taking the time for attending tonight. Hopefully, we'll see you again next week. Um, again, next week, our, our topic is Employment Survival Guide COVID-19 and Beyond by Bar Marla Linderman. Um, all of you take care and we will see you guys soon. Thank you. Thanks.